Welcome back. My name is Darian. And I'm Felicia. And you are watching Night School, the live web series where we bring together scientists, artists, and creators to explore a new facet of our natural world every month and answer your questions. Tonight, not only do we have a brand new episode of Night School for you, you may have noticed we also have a new host. <laughs> Felicia <laughs> is joining Aria and I as a co-host from month to month. Felicia, how are you feeling? I'm really excited to be joining the team for my very first night school, and I'm also really looking forward to what we're going to learn tonight. Well, we are very excited to have you joining us. Uh, Felicia, who do we have the great pleasure of talking with tonight? Um, our three guests tonight are Kelsey Lopez and Drs. Clarissa de Carvalho and Ivana Lima, and they are here to talk about their work studying Brazilian birds. We're taking a trip to one of Brazil's most unique environments, but not the humid, wet, dense rainforest you might immediately think of when you think of Brazil. We're going to Brazil's dry diagonal, a swath of semi-arid scrubland that stretches across the country. Um, we'll start our trip with Dr. Clarissa de Carvalho. Through her PhD work, Clarissa studied how epigenetics influence evolution and what genes affect camouflage. Now, as a postdoctoral researcher at Federal University of Sao Paulo, her work is focusing on understanding how birds diversify in dry environments across Brazil. Our next guide through the dry diagonal will be Dr. Ivana Lima. As a postdoctoral researcher at the Federal University of Pernambuco, Ivana studies bird ecology and evolution. Her work focuses on patterns in how different bird species distributed across Brazil, how different bird species are distributed across Brazil's di dry diagonal, which is one of the most vulnerable regions in the country. And to wrap up our trip, we will speak to Kelsey Lopez, who is currently a third year PhD student at Harvard University. Kelsey is also no stranger to Brazil's dry diagonal and uses the findings of her fieldwork aided by museum collections and genetic sequencing. Kelsey's research aims to understand what causes bird species to evolve. I am very much looking forward to this episode. <laughs> As always, night school viewers, let us know where you're watching from, whether you're with us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitch, oh my gosh, so many platforms. Uh, <laughs> please comment, chat, share your questions during the presentations and we'll collect them all to be asked during a big group Q&A sesh at the end. <laughs> Yay. And with that, we'll turn it over to Clarissa. Okay. Hello, everyone. First, I'd like to say that I'm very excited for you for, well, okay. Come on. All right. So, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Darian and Felicia. We are very excited to be here tonight talking about the evolution and birds. Brazilian birds, yes, but more specifically Brazilian birds from dry biomes in Brazil. So, what um, we, the three of us, we are focused in a project that aims to understand the origin of the species of the Brazilian dry biomes. And what do we mean by origin of species? It's when two populations, they diverge more and more to the point that they will become different species. And one of the processes that through which this can happen is via geographical barriers that will impede the individuals to go from one population to the other and mix their genes. So basically, they will be allowed to accumulate differences across time to the point that they will become different species. But these differences, they can be advantageous, disadvantageous, or even neutral. It doesn't make a difference because they are isolated, so they can differentiate more and more through time. A different process is when there is natural selection involved, when there are environment that um, they exert pressures in the populations to the point that they will select on the advantageous um, on the advantageous individuals and remove the disadvantageous ones, um, those that have disadvantageous traits, I mean. 
And well, if the individuals from the different environments, they go to different um, uh, to the different ones, they will be selectively removed. So these two forces can contribute to isolating species to the point that they, they will isolate populations to the point that they will become different species. So how about Brazilian dry, uh, dry biomes? Why are they so interesting? So here I'm representing these um, biomes and they go in the shape of a diagonal across the country. And they are represented by one environment called Cerrado, characterized mainly by the poor and deep soil to the point that when it rains, which occurs seasonally, more specifically during the summer, um, the rain, it pours, but it's easily drained because the soil is very sandy. So the water goes away and is not retained in the environment, except for some particular areas. So there are some environments actually that have some water. So this is characterized by um, a higher vegetation stratum in the Cerrado, but there are some areas without any abundance of water, which characterizes a uh, savanna. Then if you enter a uh, savanna, a uh, Brazilian savanna and the Cerrado, that's what it looks like. This trees with the twitched twigs with the leaves that are hard to the touch. Another environment is the Caatinga, and it rains less than in the Cerrado, but it rains more than the desert. Therefore, it is semi-arid because it can rain sometimes. But yeah, it's drier than the Cerrado, and the soil is characterized by being rocky and shallow. So why is this environment interesting to understand the evolution of species? because these environments are surrounded by the two largest rainforests in South America, the Amazon and the Atlantic forest. So these populations from the human environments can go into the dry environments and back. So this allows them many opportunities for geographical isolation and natural selection to occur and therefore to originate new species. And with this, along with the heterogeneity of each environment, makes these two biomes very rich in endemic species. The Cerrado particularly is a biodiversity hotspot, concentrating 5% of the world fauna and more than 12,000 plant species. The Caatinga is less species, but has many endemic species, species that you can only find there and nowhere else in the world. What does it happen with birds? So there are many birds that are endemic to the Brazilian dry diagonal. And in fact, there are entire lineages that you can only find in there. And these birds, they have series of adaptations to cope with the conditions in the dry environments, to cope, for example, with the water stress and the heat. So they might have the most obvious adaptations um, related to water conservation and thermal tolerance, but less obvious ones such as behavioral changes. For example, them going foraging in early hours, not in the middle of the day, and plumage adaptation that might protect them from abrasion and from the UV rays. And the main system that we're going to investigate is the helmeted mannequin. They are endemic species from the um, Cerrado in Brazil. And you might know them better from their closest relative species, which is the blue mannequin. This species is one of the favorites of people who make nature documentaries because they are, they compose this leg displays to impress the females. So you gather three or four males and they jump across the other. And only one alpha male will mate. So if the female wants, of course. However, in this key species, the, the legs seem to have been lost, or at least that's what some researchers think. That's kind of debatable because one of the hypotheses is that because they are exposed to harsher environments, they do not, they cannot waste their resources 
on having bunches of males that are not even going to mate. So this might be a constraint from being in a harsher environment compared to rainforests. Along with this, there are many other characteristics that um, this species might have to adapt to dry environments. And one of the ways that we can do so is by comparing with its close relatives present in the rainforest, both the blue mannequin and the lace-tailed mannequin. This is an ongoing project, just to give you a little sneak peek on what's going on and how we can ask some questions. But for this presentation, I'm going to focus on the helmeted mannequin and its even closer species, the Aradipi mannequin, which is a critically endangered species because it can only be found on the top of a high plateau in the middle of the Caatinga. In this top of the plateau, the temperature is a little bit lower and there is a higher humidity than the rest of the Caatinga, which is in semi-arid. A good metaphor is imagining it is an island in a sea, but the sea is uh, semi-arid conditions. And this species has already been described in 1998. So this is a point to be proven that there are more bird species out there to be found. So what can we do with this two bird species? Well, we can collect some samples from museums that are out there from previous collections. And our collaborators have gone to the, the plateau, the Araripe plateau, to collect some blood samples from the Araripe mannequin. And with those samples, we extract DNA, we have them sequenced, and with that, we get some bioinformatic data with which we can ask some questions. So the first question that we can do, it, we can make is, are these birds different enough to be considered different species? And this is not a trivial question because they have only recently diverged, only a couple of thousand years ago, which is not much considering the geological time. And well, we cannot get the female from one species and the male from the other and put them on a cage and hope they will mate because, well, first, this is a critically endangered species. And second, that will be to put them under so much stress to the point that they might mate or not, and that will not necessarily reflect what happens in nature. So what we can do is to ask the DNA how differentiated they are in general. We can ask whether these populations here are closer to this one than considering this ones that are more in the south, in the border between Cerrado and the Atlantic forest. And what we found is that they do cluster by the appearance. So these ones, they cluster as one unique biological entity, and so does this one, to the point that they could be considered different species. Then we can move on to ask, how was this new species formed? This is an ongoing project, but I'm only going to um, discuss some of the hypotheses that we've been testing. One of them is, imagine this is their... Um, their um, ancestor, and they moved on to a different point in the top of the plateau where the other one is found. And once this population was isolated, they became different species. An alternative hypothesis is that their common ancestor had a wider distribution, but that it contracted because of any kind of change, and later they became isolated. So we do not have the answers for this yet. However, we suspect that the second scenario is more likely because there have been some climatic changes in the Caatinga that changed the way that it is right now. So it became drier and the vegetation has changed. So it's possible that with this climatic change, there was a range contraction isolating the population in the top of the plateau where the conditions were better. Finally, can we detect any traces of natural selection? In other words, can we find any specific regions of the genome that are more differentiated than the rest of the background of the genome? So here represented some different regions of the genome. Some of them, they are similar. Some of them, they are neutral. They are expected to have evolved by their isolation. So here, in this case, this region is more differentiated, so we expect higher differences. What did we find? 
we found that there was an extraordinary number of genes that are related to brain development and neuron plasticity. We do not really know what this means yet, but by looking at medical literature, we found that these genes that we found, they are associated with differences in behavior, learning, and memory. So how this exactly can relate to the divergence between these two species, it's still unclear, but we are refining our explanation. And you might be wondering, well, what about the difference in plumage? That's the most obvious characteristic. And indeed, we found that there are some genes controlling for melanin, they are more differentiated than expected by chance. So, yes. In other words, they are... There is another pressure other than the isolation that is driving them apart. It could be natural selection, but it could be also sexual selection, among other nuances in this hypothesis that I won't have time to discuss here. So in the bigger picture, what this little tail of the birds tells us about the big picture? Well, I think the message that comes here is that this mode of origin of species could be happening in other places in the world and in the Brazilian dry diagonal. So there are many tops of the mountains and plateaus that could be harboring lots of new species because these changes in the climate, past and contemporary, are probably driving them to differentiate. And the Brazilian dry biomes are a good system to study it because there is the same matrix of climate change in tops of the mountains. And finally, I would like to end by making an urge to pay attention to what's happening in this biome because it's under great threat because of the agriculture and the cattle. So a wonderful biome with a very rich biodiversity that needs to be protected, not only for the sake of protecting nature, but also to assure our survival as humans. And with that, I would like to thank everyone and pass on my word to Ivana. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Clarissa, for, for sharing with us. This is fascinating work. I know you do a lot of work with mannequins, with the Araripe and helmeted mannequins. Um, but with such a big biome like the dry diagonal, do you have a, a bird species that you feel is the most underrated? Underrated. Well, I think one that here we take for granted, but I don't know if people in the US know, is the Siriema. They have the most wonderful song. They do duets and yeah, you should check them out. The Siriamas are fascinating birds. And they look like little Brothers. dinosaurs when they communicate with each other, like doing the beaks like this. The Siriama like really this long side legs. of birds. Yeah, really long legs, yeah. Oh, that's an and amazing And they're found answer. across okay. the dry diagonal, yeah. Awesome, okay. Great, thank you so much for sharing. We'll get back to you later when we do our group Q&A, but now we will hear from Dr. Ivana Lima. Oh, hi guys, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here at night school, telling you a little bit about the birds in the dry forest of South, of South America in Brazil and about some of the work, the, some of the projects that we, uh, we have been developing in, in here. So today I'm going to talk about a different universe that few people know about, the one of the dry forests that exists in South America and how the use of current tools can help us uh, uncover hypotheses created in the past and there are still most discussed uh, to this day. So just a little about me, I'm now a postdoc in the Universidade Federal de Pernambuco in Brazil, where I started studying birds in 2012 when I studied the reproductive success of steppe birds and how the bird species were affected by agricultural practice in Portugal. After that, back in Brazil, I entered the world of the dry forests as an undergraduate uh, studying uh, behavior ecology and then phylogenetic predictors of mobbing behavior against the ferruginous pygmy owl. That is like this beautiful illustration here. 
in the Caatinga, a dry forest in Northeast Brazil, as Clarissa showed us before. It was also as an undergraduate that I discovered that I could paint birds, and this is an activity that I still practice uh, to today. After graduating, I lived for two years in Manaus, in the middle of the Amazon forest in the North region of Brazil, where I did my master's degree, I studying biogeography patterns and contact zones between two species of Amazon endemic woodpeckers. My study area in this case was the food plant forest of the for, of Amazon, the as forests de Vazia, which are the forests who are flooded by the Amazon River during part of the year, and that you can only access by boat during this flood season. It was a really cool study, which allowed me to get to know different places, different species, and different people. And I recommend to every scientist and biologist to go to Amazon at least once. It is an amazing experience. After my master, I returned to the Northeast of Brazil, and I started my PhD when I decided to combine my biggest interest in science. There are biogeography, dry forests, and the use of genomic tools to answer hypotheses. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. When you hear about the Brazil, I bet images like this come to mind, like beautiful beach, like the Rio de Janeiro. And when we think about forests in South America and Brazil, what always come to mind are the large humid forests of the Amazon in the north of South America, north of Brazil, and the Atlantic Forest on the east coast of Brazil, near the Atlantic Ocean. What many people don't know is that in a good extension of South America and crossing almost dividing Brazil in half, there are dry forests and savannas. The largest areas composed of these open dry forests are found in the Circum Amazonia distribution, which fragments present in almost every a country of South America. And these domains present themselves as a complex of vegetation types, which includes several phytophysiognomies, such as the Llanos, between Colombia and Venezuela in North South America, the Savannas Rupununi, between Venezuela and Guiana, the Andrew Dry Valleys between Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, and the Chiquitano also in Bolivia, and the three domains that compose the so-called dry diagonal, the Chaco, the Cerrado in central, uh, in central Brazil, and the Caatinga in Northeast Brazil. In humid forests, such as the Amazon and the Atlantic forest, the influence of, of historical process that occurred millions of years ago on the current patterns of species distributions, that the distributions that we see today has already been were really well discussed uh, over the time. But as for the dry forests of South America, one of the most commonly discussed hypotheses that aims to explain the biogeographic patterns that we see today, that is the way the, in which the species that are associated with these uh, dry environments are distributed today, is the Pleistocene uh, hypothesis. This hypothesis was published almost 30 years ago uh, by Dario Prado and Peter Gibbs using the distribution of wood plant species as a model. And according to their, their hypothesis, according to them, the current fragment, fragments of open dry uh, forests that, that are distributed in these patches in South America would have been connected during the climatic oscillations that happened in the Pleistocene, shrink existing rainforests and facilitating the expansion of these dry patches of dry forests. That would be then form an uh, interconnected belt, facilitating this way colonization events by species and also distribution expansions of these species along uh, the dry forests in the whole continent which would possibly explain the existence of species that have the population restricted to the current fragmented of dry forests that we see in South America today. For birds, for example, or we know some species that have the, distrib the population distribution associated with these dry forest fragments. Some examples are the Facelodon zufriferans, the rufous fronted thornbird, Corifus pingus cuculatus, the red crested finch, and 
the pearl invented totari and emitricus margarita seventa if we, and if we look into these species and if you look into their distributions today and if you think you were to find the evidence of the Pleistocene arc then it's like to be between these widespread species with geographically disjunct populations but looking at this how then could we investigate whether the distribution patterns that we see today for species like this corroborate over field uh, hypothesis postulated 30 years ago. Nowadays, uh, we have genomic tools, such as the whole genome sequence. They are much more accessible now than they are a few years ago. And with the whole genome sequence, there was an extremely expensive technique just a few years ago, and now it can be used uh, in studies with non-model organisms, such as the pearl vented totarite, this allow us to explore pets and questions that were impossible to answer just a short time ago. Using whole genome sequencing in a species such as this, uh, which has the, the population distributing in the fragments uh, of dry forests along the South America, allow us to understand, for example, whether there is a uh, genomic structure between these populations. Uh, that means over what time scales these populations were separated and in what what would indicate that these populations could be connected in the in the recent past the pearly vented toe tyrant uh, have described phenotypic variation which means there are difference in plumage inside the same species different in, in color variation in the color of the eyes the feathers and this variation resulted in the description of nine subspecies inside the Emetricus margaritas event inside the pearl vented totarian species. And, and their distribution ranged from the north of Colombia, passing for Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, and a longitudinal distribution in Brazil, Caatinga, Cerrado, and Chaco. Using the pearly vented totarian tissue samples available in scientific collections uh, in the US and Brazil collections, some of them collected over a hundred years ago by researchers who are who are exploring the South America a hundred years ago, and using these samples from different localities and associating these samples with these recent available genomic tools, it was possible to obtain a large amount of data they allow me to better understand the history of these populations and see if the history of these species can be associated with the Pleistocene arc hypothesis. First, with this huge amount of data that I have received from my sequences, we built a mitochondrial tree, which is like a family tree, like a gene genealogical tree, and shows the relationships between the individuals that we analyze. So in here, if you look closer, the, the, the individuals who are closer are more similar. They are like brothers and sisters. And those who are further away are more different, like distant cousins. Uh, and this, this phylogenetic tree is all based in the mitochondrial DNA. So in our mitochondrial tree, we found the presence, the presence of a well-supported clade uh, separating a north population and a south population uh, with these this samples from Peru and the dry diagonal. As we can see here on the map where each of these these circles are individuals that we analyze and each color represents a possible ancestral population for this species. And these all occur during the middle Pleistocene, uh, at least uh, two million of years ago. This division was followed by the divergence and rapid diversification of the northern population, also during the middle Pleistocene, uh, between one million years ago, who separated the two populations, separated the north population in two, one of the North Venezuela and Colombia, and another population with the individuals who inhabit uh, the tepuis of Amazon uh, in South Venezuela and Colombia. The separation between the Peru and the dry diagonal populations also occurred during the middle Pistocene, but more recently, uh, less than one million of years ago. And what does this show to us? First, 
we recover to these to these species uh, the genetic group is separating the subspecies along the dry gra gradient that surrounds the Amazon with different levels of genetic structure within each group. Uh, this suggested to us that there was a shared ancestry between the subspecies analyzed, which indicates that they possibly were all together in the past. They are, they are all the same population in the past. All of these split events that we see in our mitochondrial tree occurred recently throughout the Pleistocene period, which may suggest to us that the, clim the climatic environmental change that will occur in South America continent could be directly impacting the structure and separating uh, in separation of these populations of these subspecies and isolating these subspecies of each other uh, along the geological time. In summary, we found in here evidence that the populations of the pearly vented tall tyrant were connecting in the recent past the pattern that, that is predicted by the, uh, the Pleistocene hypothesis. Therefore, this species brings one more evidence to science that corroborates these long discussed hypotheses. Just like this example I show you, are there still a lot of questions and scenarios that, such as, are there more species following this pattern that we can test? Where did these dry forest taxa originate? They, they came from another dry forest, they came from humid forest. Where, where did these this species came from? How can species like that adapt to such hot and dry environments? And how will these species handle future, uh, future climate change scenarios? Uh, all, of this all, all of these questions that we can test and try to answer using not only these uh, recent genomic tools, but also new methods that are more accessible every day. And I'm, as a scientist, I'm looking forward to continue to exploring all these systems. And, and I, I say to you, there is a great time for doing science now because we have access to all this information. And my research has been supported by a series of institutions that I, I would like to thank in here. And I also thank you all for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Savannah, thank, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really, really interesting. Um, and also just so much diversity um, in this environment. Like it's really cool to learn. Um, but with all this diversity, it's your turn for the question of the night. In your opinion, what is your most underrated bird that makes its home in Brazil's dry diagonal? Oh, in the Brazilian dry diagonal, I think most people don't care about like the the little tyrannid species like mm -hmm. i don't know if you guys know the bain tv species that we call here they are all over the city and all over the dry diagonal too is a really common species so i think this is a underrated species in here <laughs> sometimes the ones the you know species that you see the most often are also just like you're so used to them so yeah. they're underappreciated yeah and they are so cool so cool <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're definitely going to have a bunch of questions for you at the group Q&A. Um, but I'd love to transition to our final speaker of the night, Kelsey. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kelsey. I am super excited to be here today to talk about some of my ongoing PhD work, um, which also has been really uh, dependent on um, my wonderful collaborations with Clarissa and Havana. And so I'm really excited to be here together with them tonight. So um, yeah, I'm talking about some of my research on the role of gene regulatory change in the evolution of arid adapted neotropical birds. Um, so here is a clade of birds of um, the ampered family, Thamnophilidae. Um, these are the Thamnophilus and Sacchisphorus ampereds. Um, these are about 30 species that are found all across the neotropics. I love this clade. <laughs> Some of my favorites are these striated birds. Um, 
And when you look at the diversity of the species in this picture, you might notice some similarities between them based on some of the phenotypic differences. Uh, for example, here um, in, the, in the top, you might think that these birds are closely related because they kind of have similar rufous or brown plumage patterns. Um, but, and, and they also live in dry tropical forests. But when you look at them on a phylogenetic tree, they are actually quite uh, di differentiated. Um, they're not so closely related as you might expect. And um, actually, uh, the species living in the dry forest have independently um, invaded these, these dry forest habitats. So, so these birds with similar plumages are not so closely related and they've kind of independently transitioned into dry forests, which are highlighted here in red. Um, while the rest of the clade, the darker plumages and species that I showed are living in humid forests. And um, again, these, these birds that look strikingly phenotypically similar um, are found in quite different geographic regions. So the species Themnophilus bernardi is in dry forests of um, Ecuador and Peru. Uh, Sacisphorus canadensis is in the northern um, dry forests of Venezuela and Colombia, and Sacis feroides cristatus um, is endemic to the Katinga. Now, let's take a step back and think about the evolutionary process in a different system. So here I'm showing you dolphins, uh, a manatee, and walruses. Now, what do these different species have in common? Um, they are all marine mammals, um, but actually they are not each other's closest relatives as well. Um, they've undergone this process called convergent evolution, which is when um, distinct lineages independently evolve similar traits. So based on a phylogeny, when we, when now we can see patterns of relatedness, dolphins and whales are actually more closely related to cows than they are to other marine mammals like the walrus and the manatee. And another um, really striking case of this process of convergent evolution is the evolution of flightlessness. Um, so ancestrally birds had the ability to fly and several times independently they lost this ability to fly. Um, you might remember the emu of Australia, kiwis of New Zealand and ostriches of um, Africa. And they all independently have just had this fascinating evolutionary repeatability of the loss of flightlessness. And when this occurs in similar environmental contexts, this is a strong signature of natural selection, as we're seeing in the um, Themnophilus and Sacisphorus amperids. Now, how can we start to unpack questions about adaptation to life in dry forests? These birds are facing a lot of pressure to, to thermoregulate in these harsh environments they must um, control their temperature while also retaining water, um, like Havana and Clarissa described. These are these habitats are characterized by um, seasonal rains, and there's there's less water available in the environment. And this involves a lot of complex physiological coping mechanisms. Um, one of the first things that comes to mind is um, retaining water. Uh, in, like decreased water loss through their kidneys and, and decreased renal water loss, um, as well as how are they maintaining their energy balances, their metabolism, and storing energy in fat and, and using this metabolic water. And another thing is um, facing these, these harsh conditions, things like the stress response, they can have... Um, processes like oxidative stress, DNA damage, repair, and heat stress that they have to cope with. So how can we um, actually start to unpack the molecular mechanisms that are underlying these complex physiological coping mechanisms? Um, when you look at the gene, when we look at the components of the genome, bird genomes are comprised of about 20,000 genes. And we can actually look at um, the 
the level of activity of these genes or which genes are actively on having expressed genes. So this gene A, for example, is turned on, expressing this intermediate, um, producing an intermediate step called RNA, um, which then goes to make the proteins that are directly involved in these physiological coping me mechanisms. Or you can have a gene that's just not turned on. Um, for example, this gene B is, is not being expressed. So you can have higher expression or lower or no expression of certain genes. And um, looking at, at what genes are turned on or turned off can tell us about what is the genetic basis of adaptation to life in these dry forests. When we compare to um, it, when we compare this species with, with its closest relative that lives in humid forest um, that's not facing these same conditions, we can start to look at these genes that underlie these adaptations. And importantly, like I mentioned, this, this transition to dry habitats has happened independently several times in this clade. There's, there's this repeated example um, and also we can use it to our power, having five different cases of species where its closest relative lives in humid forest. And um, we can look at the genes differential expression between the dry lineages and the humid lineages. And one um, typical gene expression analysis method is looking at gene, um, uh, gene log full change of gene expression levels. So on the left of each individual plot, these are genes that are, say, like down-regulated. On the right, you see genes that might be up-regulated, and you have the significance cutoff um, of the, the p-value. And I'm planning on looking across um, all five species pairs and looking to see if there's, there's any overlap. And if there is an overlap across all these species pairs, that would be pretty convincing evidence that these genes might be involved in um, the arid habitat adaptation. So to start to, to ask this question, I bring my lab into the field and um, I take all my equipment and uh, material to work and collect blood and tissue from these birds. And I've worked with some really wonderful students. Um, this doesn't even begin to highlight just how wonderful some of the field work has been. Um, these are some of the students that helped me in the field. And uh, these are two examples of species in the clade that I have um, captured here. One of my favorites in the bottom right. Um, yes, so, so I, I pack everything up. <laughs> um, pack all my scientific equipment in my suitcase and my cat here was not happy about that. And I've been working mostly in the Katinga um, and uh, collecting the closest relatives in the adjacent Atlantic forest and hum uh, Amazon forest. Then we take everything back and we keep all the material at super low temperatures, like for example, in this liquid nitrogen tank um, this picture of me in an Uber after filling the liquid nitrogen tank in Brazil. Um, and then I, I take it back to Harvard to extract RNA. And this is me extracting RNA recently. So I've been working to extract from several species and I'm hoping to submit soon to, act, to really start um, teasing apart these gene expression differences. So another system that I'm really interested in um, is the blue-gray tanager and the Sayaka tanager. Um, these are two species. The uh, Episcopus blue-gray tanager is endemic mostly to the um, Amazon in this humid forest. Also within this Pleistocene arc that Havana mentioned, and there's a species throughout the Sayaka that is um, more is in this in this dry diagonal region. They diverged about 500,000 years ago. Um, they're super common across like most, <laughs> like they're super common city birds. You, you've probably seen them if you traveled here. And I'm really interested in them because they actually meet and hybridize along the transition zone between the Amazon and the dry diagonal. So these hybrids 
they're, they're two separate species, Sayaka and Episcopus, and they, they have these hybrid intermediate um, that has an intermediate uh, wing patch. It's the parental species you see clearly, they differ in this white wing patch and the hybrids kind of have an intermediate. And so they, they're in the, they've speciated and so they're different enough um, that, that they are separate species. They form hybrids and usually that's, that's not a third species. Like there's some hybrid incompatibilities there have been hybrids discovered, but um, they're not so common. But anyway, these hybrids are really interesting to answer a lot of different questions, which I'll come back to. But yeah, this the fact that they meet along this transition or ecotone between the Atlantic, the Amazon forest and the dry diagonal, um, and the species is separated by this, this humidity, humidity gradient. This blue color that we see in the birds um, is really interesting. So blue coloration in birds is actually a function, it's called structural coloration. So birds have pigments in their feathers like melanins. They can also have reds, yellows, and oranges that are from pigments. Um, but blue is a result of refraction based on the structure of this keratin cortex and spongy layer. But at the bottom of this, we do have some pigments, um, which are melanin. And this is important because, um, well, there are not many rules in, in uh, ecology and just not many rules in ecology and evolutionary biology, but one rule that holds up is called Gloger's rule. And this has to do with phenotypic differences across um, different environmental conditions. And Gloger's rule states that um, Within a species, individuals living in warmer and wet environments tend to be more melanated than those species living in dry and cold environments. And this is thought to um, help facilitate many different processes. The main ideas are could be camouflage, like for example, a bird living in humid tropical forest has more shade to, um, it's, it's more shaded, so they're more camouflaged if they're darker, more melanated in humid forest. And it, it's also thought to help be protection against UV and protection against um, parasites because melanins actually have caused feathers to degrade. Uh, they're more resistant to degradation and wear and tear on the feathers. Um, and the, the system, the, the blues, if you noticed, um, they're slightly different, like the, the blue gray tanager and Sayaka tanager differ a little bit in their in the gray bluish pigment. So I'm really interested in seeing if there's any differences in this degree of melanization across the habitat. But um, because I'm working on gene regulation and gene expression, there's another interesting question I hope to um, answer with them. And so gene, um, expression is extremely complex. It's just a very, so I talked about gene expression, how genes can turn on and off, but the genomic underlying um, mechanisms that actually control gene expression is quite complex. You can have, um, for example, upstream of a gene that you're turning on, you can have these cis regulatory regions which um, are the DNA sequence itself near the gene that you're controlling, or you can have um, these transcription factors, which actually come and bind and turn the gene on or off. And it's, it's when this transcription factor binds. Um, and basically controlling and coordinating these factors is a really complex interactive network. And when you think about the evolution of gene expression and a, a species, the genome of a species that is diverging. For example, if you have a species that has been separated by a geographic barrier, which um, divert allopatry just means separated by some barrier, um, in the genome, these cis regulatory sequences might be more different than the, than the actual transcription factor that comes and binds has to also change to keep up with it so that the gene is actually expressing properly then over time, sequence changes again, and then the transcription factor that's binding also has to change again to actually 
make sure that the gene is expressing properly. Um, and it, it's, it's basically this kind of coevolution between the genomic components that allow for the genes to actually be expressed properly. And if you have these birds come together, like in the case of these hybrids, you are combining the genomes together um, in this kind of intermediate bird and totally disrupting the genetic background of all these components that have to work together to allow for the, the genes to actually be expressed properly. And you can get misexpression, mis-expression here because um, the, the network just came apart and then came back together like halfway all mixed up. And anyway, this, this may, might be getting into nitty gritty of this, but the main point is that the hybrids are a system that allow me to actually um, look at the mechanisms that regulate gene expression. And so in my previous um, research that I, that I just mentioned between the ant birds and looking at the gene expression differences, this other system can actually allow me to start really unpacking the, the mechanisms that shape this gene expression divergence. And um, taking a step back, this, this is really quite um, amazing how far we've come in, in the kinds of questions we can apply to these birds. Um, they are non-model systems. Just 10 years ago, the amount of sequences that have, were available for bird species is nothing like it is today. And the kinds of questions we can ask about specific genes being turned on and the machinery that's actually regulating that. And in this, in this project, I'm hoping to use these hybrid um, tanagers to understand the mechanisms that shape gene expression divergence between um, uh, species. And yeah, it's just like, there are so many questions we can ask about uh, species diversification at large scales, as well as going into really, um, fine scale detail about at the at the cellular level at um, just very detailed um, scales about the processes that are happening in these birds and how they might be important in life in the dry diagonal. And all of this has been really wonderful. Some my field work, I've worked with a lot of wonderful students, postdocs, professors, been working with UNIFESPI, the Federal University of Pernambuco, and MZUSPI to, to gather material for my research. And um, yeah, and I, I've been um, exploring and thinking about a lot of um, climate related questions, processes that are happening in these habitats, and as well as collecting material along the way, both for the Harvard Museum, um, not just for the ornithology collection, but for the cryo collection, the tissue collection, as well as um, gathering material for other museums like MZUSPI and UFPE. And yeah, I'm, that is all I have today. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Kelsey. That was fascinating. I have so many questions, uh, but I will ask them uh, when we get to our major group Q&A, where we raise all the questions from our audience. First, I do have our question of the night. Which bird from Brazil's dry diagonal do you feel is the most underrated? That is a great question, Darian. And I was thinking about it um, when you asked Havon and Clarissa. Um, so one bird that's really cool is called Cryphosphingus pileatus. I'm pulling up a picture on my phone. I think you'll appreciate it. It looks like just a typical gray bird, but it has this crazy hat. And when it actually raises this, this like pileated red hat, it's really beautiful. And so maybe not so well-known bird of the dry diagonal, but I appreciate it. Is that in your hand? Yes. Amazing. Awesome. <laughs> I have so many more questions. So does our audience. I encourage everyone to keep asking questions. So we are about to enter our group question session. Uh, we'll see you on the other side of this transition.
Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for all of those amazing presentations. I just want to say that like Brazil is in the chat. They are having a great time. They are so happy to see uh, all of this research uh, being done in their country. Well represented. Love that energy. <laughs> great. <laughs> So the first question that we have uh, for all of you is, it's so clear how much diversity there is just in the bird world in Brazil. How do you choose like a study organism or clade to, to research? Ivana, would you like to start? <laughs> oh, I, I think it's a combination of events. Uh, you choose because you like the, the species, like it's a species that you find beautiful or has a cool system, a cool distribution, a, a cool vocalization. So I think it's different aspects of the bird. Do yeah, you guys have, feel something different? I don't know. I have a different answer to this because I'm the kind of scientist that is more driven by the question so I did, I worked on stick insects on my PhD and now I'm working on birds. So it's more like the question and what is the best model to understand those questions? Yeah, with this, um, with these projects, I think I'm used to thinking more about things within a species questions, um, like Clarissa just mentioned, but uh, this, this lab has been pushing me more towards comparative approaches and looking at deeper evolutionary time and trying to pick the right system, like, like Themnophilus is these, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger group of birds, but the case of convergence in the dry habitats is what brought me in. Great, really cool. Um, I love that like all of you have your different also answers to this question. There's like so much to study and this environment is really cool. Um, we actually got quite a few questions from the audience. Um, actually wondering, are these, you know, what are the threats um, to this environment, to this dry diagonal? Are these dry forests threatened like the tropics are? Maybe what are the ways um, that we're seeing. Okay, I can answer that because I presented it. Basically, in the past decades, uh, people managed to adapt soy crops to grow in the Cerrado. So they, it was a very poor, sometimes acidic soil. So now it's being put down to have some agriculture to raise crops. So basically soy is the main one, but also cattle. So it's being put down to have large monocultures in cattle. So these are the main threats. It is an environment that is constantly going through fire. Um, the fire is part of the environment, but the natural fire. Nowadays, the anthropic fire is going much worse and that's part of the process of putting it down. Hmm. We have a question uh, from April for you specifically, Ivana. You showed very briefly um, some of your art that you've done, which was gorgeous. Um, April wants to know a little bit more about your artistic practice and if it influences the way that you do science or vice versa. Mm. I think definitely yes, because it's almost therapeutic when you paint and you have to pay attention and why are you painting the colors and the variation of the plumage. So while you're painting, you are asking questions to yourself, like how this originated? How are these, <laughs> these species so different? So I think def definitely yes. Yeah, my, my art uh, ha uh, has like a brought me closer increasing my interest in birds and makes me think, yeah. 
I guess when you like do art, you're, you have to look at your subjects more closely. So it inspires um, those fun questions. Um, and then I have another question from the audience. Um, all, all of you, if you'd like to put in your input, um, what is it like to do field work in these habitats across the dry diagonal? Kelsey, I think oh, you can Kelsey. say yeah. <laughs> So, yes, I am not adapted to the dry diagonal. It is, it is very hot. It's really hard to work um, sometimes during the day. We set like little umbrellas up, like we work out of the trunk of the car and like sometimes we have to set umbrellas up if we can't find proper shade. And also sometimes we have to keep moving the car to like follow the shade so we're not working in the direct sun. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's so cool. It's, it's, it's just really beautiful. And I, I never get tired of the, the birds and working there. But I am here in wintertime in Massachusetts and I am not built for the weather down there. <laughs> they make fun of me and say that I'm, Kelsey's melting. <laughs> Yeah, it must be it must feel great to get back into like the cold Boston winter. You're like one of three people to probably feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Instagram. Um, how much do we know about like the actual number of species that exist in these habitats? Um, or like how do we even conduct these estimates? Okay, so there are biases, right? So Birds, they are among the group of animals that are most known because they are very visible, very bright, and they sing. So we can say that the number is more or less to the point. But like I mentioned in my presentation, we just discovered a new species 20 years ago. And... I bet there are some others there that have not been described as different species yet. There are some that are still in people's to-do list to describe. But when it comes to insects, for example, there are so many yet to be described. There is so much that we don't know there, or even in plants, there are many plants that are there to be understood. But like Ivana well said, this has been an environment that it's not so focused and uh, people don't tend to focus on this environment so much compared to the Amazon or Atlantic forest. So there must be much more in there than we imagine. For, for the dry diagonal, we have like uh, pine, point counts with the species that we can hear and, and see. And we have an estimation of almost um, 800 species in the dry diagonal in Brazil. So in Caatinga, Cerrado, and Chaco is in this area of 800, 900 species of birds. No wow. species. That's a, that's a ton of diversity. OK, I think we have one more question just to wrap up the night. We want to hear from everyone. Um, what did each of your journeys to ornithology look like? I know, Clarissa, you mentioned you studied stick insects earlier, um, but how did you end up doing such cool research in this field? Okay, do, I can start. So I began by studying stick insects and their camouflage. So when you understand camouflage, you need to see from the viewer point and it tends to be birds so i started studying birds because they were the viewer from which the insect was trying to hide from and that's how i got more familiar with the birds literature and yeah i came back to brazil and i ended up working on birds which is really cool that makes a ton of sense what about you ivana uh, I started to work with birds in my as an undergrad. I always find like really interesting the questions that we can ask, the the questions that we can answer, and also because it's a 
they are so nice like it's easier to study them we, we can go to the field and it's not like that difficult to watch them to observe them so it's a really cool object of study and the questions that we that we can answer using birds are are like a lot of questions and a lot of interesting questions of every aspect behavior ecology genomics is like incredible i have all of your presentations sparked a bunch of questions for me so it's like um and kelsey what about you yeah i i echo that sentiment and i was really drawn to some of the most amazing um traits in birds like migration people can use um just the types of experiments that you can do with birds like people people put backpacks on birds and can track them all over the globe and just thinking about adaptations for a powered flight and they're great birds are really beautiful and they also have small genomes and we can sequence their small genomes but yeah i was drawn to their behavior and um just the amazing diversity of birds thinking about birds with a little backpack has just brought me so much joy already. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kelsey, Clarissa, Ivana. Thank you so much for sharing all of your awesome work with us um, from both the lab and the dry, you know, to the dry diagonal. We really, really appreciate it. Well, yes, thank, thank you, you all so much. Bye. Thank, thank you so much. You so And we're back. <laughs> um, yeah, I know we just thanked all of our guests, but they they deserve, uh, all, I'm gonna say it again, thank you so much to Kelsey, <laughs> Clarissa, and Ivana for sharing like all of that really cool research and absolutely for showing us all those amazing pictures and teaching us about all those really spectacular and unique birds. The Syria, the Sir, oh, I'm gonna butcher that word. The one with the long legs with the, we all Googled it. It's, they're gorgeous. <laughs> Um, Night School is live the first Tuesday of the month with insightful and interactive conversations with scientists and their friends, which means we will be back on April 2nd with the exact same Night School that you know and love, where we will bring together three scientists, creators, innovators to share their research and answer your questions. It's a science party. And as always, you're invited. Until we do return, um, you can rewatch past episodes now 94, including this one um, on our YouTube channel. And if you'd like, here is a QR code and a link going into the chat to the survey that helps us to continue to make night school with you, the viewers, in mind. I know we got some comments today about things that people would love to see. There is a rabid penguin fan somewhere on Instagram. <laughs> um, listen, we're listening to you. Um, so please fill out the, the form and we will continue to produce Night School with you in mind. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us. Um, we will see you April 2nd. Have a great night.